those efforts. And um, and then all of a sudden toilet paper starts running out and everyone's <laughs> freaking out about toilet paper. Then I start freaking out about toilet paper because everyone else is freaking out about toilet right. paper. And, you know, masks are running low, gloves are running low, hand sanitizer running low. I, I'm washing my hands like 12 times a day now. Um, and so it, it, it definitely caused a little bit of mayhem just because there's so many unknowns at first. And like then people within my community and Hmong family here in Broomfield actually uh, caught uh, COVID. Um, their, their grandmother passed away, but their, their father was actually the first person in the state of Colorado to be released from COVID-19. Yeah, so... You know that it once it hits your community, kind of the, the reality of it kind of hits a little harder. Um, and then you start watching the news, and then all of a sudden, like it's hard not to get caught up in it. I think that we thought it would be a 14 day event, and then things would maybe turn back into what we had expected. Uh, our kids came home from school. We had been homeschooling for three years and just this fall, last fall 2019, they went back into a school. Suddenly then in March, they were told that they'd be doing online school. So it was another adjustment for them. I think the first way that I was trying to deal with it was with a lot of humor and looking at things in just with a lot of I don't know. I tend to be somewhat uh, sarcastic at times, <laughs> and I think that I just let that be an outlet for me to kind of take things and 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 find the humor in them. It's been really hard to not be able to see people in person, to not have meetings in person. Because obviously in my, in my work, my line of work, uh, personal connection is very important. And so we've really had to flex with what we do and had to do a lot of experiments with our ministry. And, um, you know, things at home have been uh, probably like a lot of people again. Uh, our four kids are teenagers. And uh, so... That's been an adventure to, for all of us to be home and for all of us to be around each other more often than normal. And so there's definitely been some, some stress and some challenges for all of us. Um, but I, I feel like we've, we've weathered it okay. Our kids definitely did get really stir crazy and uh, so after the stay at home order, initially it was the stay at home order uh, where, you know, just like a lot of other. In late summer of last year, that was 1918, the paper in Leadville was full of articles that were patriotic about the war. And then there were letters to the editor about prohibition and the upcoming election about that. But, uh, of course, Leadville already has prohibition, but there are people that insist on having alcohol. Now, before long, we were reading in the paper about the Spanish flu, and people were getting letters in the mail from friends, uh, and they were talking about how that disease was affecting friends and family in different places. And of course, there's a, whoa, do you know that we got a letter, now that I think of it, from my uh, son John's wife over there in Nebraska. And she mentioned the flu, and she also let us know about um, her oldest boy who is overseas in the Army. It's always so good to hear about him. You know, he's a wonderful boy. Well, we'd been doing all of that, and we'd been hearing all of that, and we'd been hearing about things that 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 we'd been reading, but there's always small town gossip. <laughs> and that spreads faster than any newspaper or letter that you could have written. Now, up in Leadville, we'd been having a very healthy summer. I don't mean to diminish any death, it's always a loss, but in July, 
we only lost 10 people out of our population. And that's less than usual, and it was the same in August and the same in September until September 30th. And that's when we had our first fatality from that Spanish flu. There was a young man that had traveled out to Washington to see a friend of his in the army camp out that way. And he came back home on the train to Leadville and he died. A week after that, we had 20 cases of the Spanish flu in Leadville and we had had five fatalities from it. By the third week in October, we were losing eight to 12 people a day from the Spanish flu. People were in a panic. Nobody knew what to do. Everybody was so afraid of that disease moving so quickly. So I got my sewing machine back out which actually my sewing machine was very old. I had it most of my life, one of my best friends, and it died. Oh no. Um, it was really hard because um, I can't get it fixed. Mm. Too old. Yeah. And you cannot buy a sewing machine these days. Um, you can't get one. So a friend of mine lent me hers. And so I learned, taught myself how to use that. And, and so that has been a kind of an adjustment because it was a lot of learning. Yeah, yeah. And adapting to. My wife and I, of course, we, uh, we had respite care that would come in uh, once or twice a week and we'd have date night. Uh, date night was gone. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So like a lot of people, we were, we were home. Um, so we did a lot of takeout and um, improvise, shall we say, um, <laughs> with, with movies, with, you know, the various streaming services, and dealt with it. Um, you know, I do have some medical knowledge, so um, th that didn't terrify me of that we are in a pandemic. Um, what terrified me more, I think, was more of how do I keep the kids and I and, you know, my husband, the family safe um, effectively. And so um, that was that was the first thing. And then the second is um, how am I going to go to work with the kids at home? <laughs> of course, once President Wilson announced we were in that war. Well, I and every woman that I know ran out and joined up with the Red Cross. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be working with the Red Cross later today, and I have my uniform right here in my bag. Look at this. There, we all have a uniform, so we look alike, and they're nice and fresh looking and clean, and they come right over your, your normal clothing that you're wearing. They have a little insignia there and one on the arm, little pockets if you need to put something there. And of course, there's a little headpiece that goes on with it. It's very nice. Let's see, where did I put that? Well, I don't see. Oh, there it is. Um, and it has that little red cross right in front, in the front of your forehead. And we all wear that, so we look alike, and we look like we're all working for the same cause, you know, which we are. We were rolling bandages, and I don't know how many socks I knitted. But as soon as we heard the word that our boys across in France were being devastated by that Spanish flu, we gave over all of our time to sew in masks to send over to the Spanish flu that, so that the boys could be safe. They were masks just like we've made for ourselves here, like this, you see? Nice white cotton masks, and, and they do, do the trick. There were thousands of these masks sent by Red Cross ladies all over the United States and from other countries as well. So we felt like we were doing a little bit, doing our part. Now, my daughter, Belle, and her husband, they also live in Leadville. And those little granddaughters of mine are just the light of my life. They are beautiful, perfect, happy little girls. 
So we tried to keep life as, as normal as we could. We didn't want things feeling out of place for those girls. But rules and regulations had been put in place by the city fathers that children under the age of 12 were not allowed to leave the house and, and so on. So that was difficult, but <clears throat> in October, both of those beautiful little girls came down with that terrible flu. Well, of course, their house was quarantined right away, and neither Belle nor the girls could leave the house. You know, when you have the disease in your house, they come and they put up a big placard on the door that says there's disease in there and nobody's allowed in or out. So Edward, who, who uh, he's um, Edward, that's my husband, George, Belle's husband, he delivers mail up there in Leadville, and he had to keep going to work, but he couldn't go home, so he was staying with friends of his from the post office, and they were making do that way. So I couldn't go in and help Belle, but I could go over to the house, so I'd put on my coat, and I'd, I'd go all the way across town and up the hill, like you do, to get to Belle's house, and I'd go get on the porch, and I'd rap on the door, and I'd holler out, Belle, what can I bring for you? What can I get in town? And she'd come, and she'd holler at me from the other side of the door. She'd say, oh, mother, I need flour or whatever it was she needed. And so I'd say, all right, I'll get it as quick as I can, and I'll be back. And then I'd go off down the hill, sliding through that new snow that we had, you know, and I'd go to town, and there I'd go either to the mercantile or to the grocery, whatever she needed, and then I'd walk all the way back up the hill with what she needed. I'd go, and I'd put it on the porch for her. And then I'd have to go and stand out in the yard while she opened the door. Well, she'd open the door and she'd bring it in and then she'd stand in the doorway and we'd wave to one another and we'd blow kisses and, and I, I couldn't touch her. I couldn't touch her and I couldn't touch my girls and I couldn't help her. It was just so hard. But, thank heaven, she and both those little girls came through it all right, and George was able to go back home to them. And my husband, Edward, he works in the mining business, but he does uh, the amalgamation, you know. He, he supervises getting the ore out from the rock. He has a very important position, so he has to go to work, and he was doing that. But by now, we were all wearing the masks, and we were washing our hands more than I've ever washed my hands in my life. and. Uh, we were avoiding our friends, you know. It just wasn't like it always has been. And, and, you know, I have always kept a clean house. But by now, every woman that I know and I, we were cleaning to beat the band, and we were fumigating, and we're cleaning again. And I just couldn't risk Edward getting ill. supplies and we had a little bit but you know we we were in that same boat of you know I went and, uh, to the liquor store and got some Everclear vodka to make hand sanitizer and got some aloe vera stuff and used some essential oils so we made a big batch of hand sanitizer for our family and we did that for the refuge as well so we would have a bunch of extra on hand in case people needed it so that was an adventure because I went to the liquor store and uh I, I said, do you have, I can't remember what it was, 210 proof or whatever. And they just kind of looked at me funny. And <laughs> like, Is this for drinking or for, and I said, no, it's for making hand sanitizer. <laughs> and the lady's like, okay, good. This, this is really not for drinking. So, <laughs> um, so I had that experience and um, yeah, it's been, it's been a, a real challenge too. And, you know, just there's the regular stuff of, family stress and relational dynamics and and COVID has just amplified all of that. Overall, it's been kind of more of a challenge, but you know, one silver lining has been, uh, my wife and I were talking, our, our girls, they have this like close sisterly relationship now, which was already kind of there before, but now they're like, they're each other's playmates. You know, they're there every day with each other. Um, and they've got this like really tight bond. They have their own little sort of imagined world they're in every day. 
Um, so that's been kind of like trying to look on the, the bright side, like, well, that probably wouldn't have happened otherwise, you know, they, right. they'd be apart at school and then, you know, our, our younger would be at daycare the summer. So, um, like I, you know, I'm 32 years old, so I'm like, I don't need masks. I don't need, and like, as things kind of spiked and you start hearing that people were I mean, sick again and again. Once people in the community started catching it, it made me realize, like, okay, I'm around my dad a lot. My dad's getting older and age. Uh, he doesn't have an like, compromised immune system, but still getting older. Um, and so I, I wouldn't want to put his family or my family or anyone else's family in danger. And so once that reality kind of hit again, it's like, okay, like, take a pause. Don't think about yourself, but think about everybody else. So I'm a lot more cautious now, especially since I'm back in the office every day now. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm definitely wearing masks now. <clears throat> I've got the two things of hand sanitizer in like the last like month and a half. Um, so I'm definitely a lot more cautious. So by now, the schools had been canceled. We weren't allowed to meet with our friends. You couldn't even go outside, out in the fresh air, and meet with more than four people at one time. There were no church services, can you imagine? And no more than four adults of the immediate family could go to any funeral. And by now there were so many funerals. You know that Obregon family next door to us, those good, good people? Father, mother, five children, all gone. In our church, there's a family, and they're all down with the flu. I, I think that the mother and the children are coming out of it. But they're not holding out much hope for the father, and that's going to be terrible, because not only was he the provider for his family as it was, there's a new baby on the way. And that baby is going to come, flu or no. Well, you see, see here, I've been working on a new blanket for that baby's christening. It's not fancy. But it'll be fresh, and it'll be something. We all have to do what we can. Now, down in Denver, they were running out of room in the hospitals for all of the sick people. And they had to go and use one of the fancy ballrooms in one of those big hotels as a makeshift hospital because they had nowhere else to put everybody. It's just the same as up here in Leadville because that St. Vincent's Hospital, you know, the one that's run by those nice Catholic sisters? Well, it was completely full up, and there was no more room for all those poor suffering souls that needed a place. So the city fathers got together, and they conscripted the Clarendon Hotel right there on Harrison Street, that main street in town, and they selected that one because it has heat, you know. And they said, we need someone to get that ready so that we can have that as, as a hospital. Well, <laughs> there are women that follow the mining men, if you know what I mean. And I must admit, I had never been very charitable about those women, and I hadn't held them in very high regard. But do you know that those were the women that stepped up and did that work of getting that hotel ready, and then they went ahead and nursed the sick. Now, I would have volunteered for that, but how could I bring that disease home to Edward, you know? Those women, they worked so hard. They got that hotel ready in no time. And they had 16 rooms ready. And within two days of that opening, there were 51 people, sick people, being ministered to the, in there by, by those women. And a lot of those women lost their lives because of the work they did. Those poor souls didn't have a family to worry about, and so they sacrificed themselves. Now, that just goes to show that you never can tell how someone's life path is going to lead them in a certain direction. And you can never can tell where you'll find the brightest stars, can you? I'm very sorry that I judged them so harshly. Well. By now, I and everyone I know in town was doing what they could 
I would make meals and take them to places where people couldn't cook for themselves. And, and then there were, were people taking in laundry for other people. And men were going out and looking after the livestock for somebody that was down and out. And they were delivering firewood and coal. And people were even taken in, the newly orphaned. I was going up and down, but then I went way down at the end of May and through June um, was a pretty dark time emotionally for me. And I was able to work on some medication and get more walking in and all of those types of things. But I, I think having the Bible study to work on and to do was a real help for me personally, but mm -hmm. it was all, also a real gift to be able just to gather with women. And what we did is because of COVID, we. Um, met outside in my backyard, um, and thankfully it's Colorado, so the weather was very nice every morning <laughs> from 6.30 <laughs> to 7.30, and we were able to enjoy some lovely sunrises and time together. Um, and the vaccine hint, I know, you know, they're going to start with the most vulnerable people first. It has to be um, enough prolific vaccine that enough people can have it that I feel like we're protected from the, from the virus. Um, and I just, I don't want to fly on an airplane. You know, they've, I, I just, I don't want to do any of that. And that's not like us. We're, you know, we're at the stage in our life where we've been doing a lot of traveling and I'm glad I've gotten to places, you know, before. Um, some people are calling 2020 like a year that didn't happen or, uh, <laughs> you know, a year of loss or whatever, you know, a blank year. Um, I don't see it that way. It reminds me in some ways of the 60s and 70s, um, what you're talking about the social injustice and the, the protests and what's turned into sometimes riots. Um, that makes me very much think of those days. Um, You know, when school does at some point hopefully resume and the kids are gone for, you know, the, the bulk of the day, five days a week, like that's going to be really hard for them. You know, I think it's going to be, it's going to be hard for us too, uh, but it's going to be hard for them to just all of a sudden, because we've just been this like family unit of four day in, day out for months and months and months. Um, and I think we've gotten to know each other better through that. And I think we've worked on sort of conflict management <laughs> um, issues that never would have arisen otherwise. Uh, so hopefully, yeah, my hope is through sort of like the rose-tinted glasses of, you know, looking back on your life in 10 years. We'll, we'll think of this as kind of like, oh, it's actually kind of, um, you know, a, a unique opportunity as a family to have this time together. That's that's my hope. We'll forget about all the all the fights and like the awful stuff. And we'll just think, oh, look at all this time we had together. How fun is that? One of the most distressing things was that we ran out of graves. Oh, my goodness. In, by November, one of the mortuaries had 42 unburied souls that they had no room for. And oh, the grieving families of, of those dearly departed, that they, they didn't have a place to, to bury them. Well, that was awful. Now, in November is bad weather in Leadville under the, the normal conditions, but this was above and beyond. But now, I'll tell you, you wouldn't think of a big mining company set, stepping up, would you? Hmm? But they did. They said that if there were miners that would go out and dig through that snow and frozen ground and make graves, they would pay them as though they were working in the mines, and then they would save their jobs for them. That got us through that terrible problem. Now, there were druggists. They couldn't get what they needed. They couldn't even get castor oil. And a lot of people were thinking that that would do the trick. And then there were people that couldn't get their fancy gargling solution that they were after. Well, our family has always used just plain salt water, but that's neither here nor there. But uh, there were shysters that were out there that were hoping to make a profit off of this terrible situation. And they were doing things like, like peddling sugar cubes that had been soaked in kerosene and telling people to eat that and, and nonsense like that. It was just shameful. And I, I'll tell you, more people than not just wanted the alcohol. 
Now, Leadville is a dry city, but there has always been a way for people with medicinal needs to get a special permit to have alcohol. And I don't know how, how this happened, but in November of last year, there were 2,000 of those permits issued. Now, I understand, although I don't hold with drinking, but uh, special circumstances may cause for special things to be done, but 2,000 permits? That seems, well, that's the way it was. And there were um, special permits, uh, more rules and regulations that were issued. And they were issuing more and more and more to keep people safe. But there were people that were saying, I don't have to wear a mask. I don't have to do anything I don't want to do. I live in the United States. It's a free country. And they were just not caring about anybody but themselves. So the city fathers sent out a request for volunteers. And a lot of good men signed up. And those men were just employees then of the Board of Health. And they were given the full benefit of the law. And they could see to it that those regulations were enforced. And they did. And they could look out and they could see if there was a new outbreak in a certain part of town and, and report that. And they could see if somebody needed extra help. And they could see to it they, that they got that. And that was very good. Now, there are some people that are living way out by the smelter, you know, on the outskirts of town. And they're all Austrian people. And they don't speak English. And they were having a terrible time because all of the, the regulations and everything that were sent out to them were printed in English. And they couldn't read it. Well, that nice Mr. Zeitz, you know, that fixes the watches in town, he took it upon himself to go all the way out there and help them to understand what they needed to do to be safe. That was a wonderful thing. And uh, the most important thing for me, prayer. That got us through a lot of the hard times, and it still is, you know. And uh, it's not just the Methodists, mind you. We have a lovely synagogue in town, and there are some very nice Catholic people in town and people of other faiths. There are just prayers flying every which way out of Leadville, I'll tell you that. But I think it pays to be a little bit, prayer, you know, Thanksgiving. Last, last Thanksgiving in November, it wasn't like it always is. Speaking of prayers, we always give prayers at Thanksgiving, and, but we have the whole family over. And I love to make a big dinner, but we couldn't do it. We couldn't be together like that. So last Thanksgiving, it was just me and Edward at the house. And we did manage to find things, as everybody did, to be thankful for, I think, because you have to look for joy in the darkest times, don't you? I think it's more possible to be healthy if you intend to be happy. So now here we are. We've lost about 250 of our people in Leadville. And we're just hoping that soon this will come to an end. In December, it let up a little bit. And people let uh, the, the city fathers said, children, you can go out sledding as long as you don't go in groups. And, People were out and waving across the street saying Merry Christmas, but it wasn't like it usually is. We, we couldn't go sing at the church. There was a little bit of a resurgence of the disease in January and a little bit more in February. But we're all just hoping and praying that this quarantine will be lifted soon. And I just, I have to give credit to the mayor and to the city fathers and to all those volunteers that helped keep hold a line against that terrible disease, and also to the people of Leadville that all worked together to keep this from becoming a worse disaster. Now, we all have to keep our wits about us, you know. But I think we're a stronger community for having weathered this. Leadville. Broomfield. 1919. 2020. Influenza. COVID-19. Fear. Death. Loss. Resilience. Hope. Love. People, People working, working together. together. United. United.